Okay, well, thank you for the invitation and for coming the last day of the summer school. I hope it's been a good experience for you. And as Stefan said, uh, for the past 20 years or so, I've been working on building computational models of human behavior, of making computers understand people. And what I'm going to present today, and I'll try to go fast so I have time, is uh, three different projects that we have done um, in the area of understanding human behavior. In this case, um, I, when I started working on this, I was using computers, like bigger computers uh, or cars, but since 2004, I've been using the most personal computer that there is, which is the mobile phone. So for the past 12 years or so, I've been looking at how we can um, use mobile phones as sensors of human behavior so we can develop more intelligent phones that will actually help us better, or we can have a better understanding of society at large, because all of us have mobile phones. So before I explain the, the projects, I just wanted to quickly introduce Telefonica Research, because I'm not sure if you've heard of it. Anyone has heard of it? Uh, it's a relatively new uh, lab. It has about 10 years old. I've been, the, I've been there for eight years. And it's a small research organization doing industrial research in a variety of topics. And the areas that uh, I've been working on and that I came uh, from the US to create are related to uh, using machine learning techniques to build individual and aggregate models of human behavior from a variety of data. A lot of it is mobile phones, mobile network data. Some of it is uh, some other service usage data, for example, uh, movie consumption you know, patterns or other services that Telefonica has. And then another area is voice analysis. Uh, and we've been working on this for the past seven years as well. So if we look at all the different um, types of human behavior that we model from the, a variety of data, we have a lot of projects related to modeling individuals, and then we have some projects about modeling uh, people in an aggregate form. Uh, so we're doing projects, for example, to bring what is called the next generation of business intelligence, going beyond knowing your gender or your age, and we've done projects on inferring, for example, your personality from, uh, mobile, from how you use your mobile phone. We are also looking into how we can uh, create new services that didn't exist until now. And I will present one project today on this about credit score inference. We are working how to improve customer service, particularly through voice, through analyzing the voice conversations to the call centers and not um, looking at what is being said, but how is being said. Because as you probably know, up to 80% of human communication is not what is being said, but how I say it, the prosodic elements of the conversation. And that's one of project that we are working on. We have a big area on recommendations and personalization, uh, recommender systems, you probably heard of them. So we've been active there for a few years now. We've also looked into other opportunities. And here I will present a project on boredom boredom inference. Something that you might uh, not have heard of is that we collaborated um, uh, since two years, I think it is two or three years, in a living lab called the Mobile Territorial Lab, which uh, was a living lab in Trento in collaboration with Telecom Italia and FBK, which is a research institute in Trento and MIT. And what this living lab consists of is about 150 people that um, voluntarily carry an instrumented phone that monitors everything they do every day. Uh, and then they also um, are uh, voluntarily subscribing to user studies if, if they want. And we carried out uh, one user study with these people in this living lab on personal data monetization, on trying to understand how much money do each of us think that our personal data is worth. And personal data in this case was the data that is being collected from the mobile phone. So your location, the phone calls that you make, the media that you consume, the apps that you run, how much money do you think this is worth? And that was one study. I'm not going to present it today, but if you are interested, I can, po I can point you to the paper. And then on aggregate, on an aggregate level, we've been working a lot on projects related to smart cities, 
types of projects, so understanding hotspots in cities by looking at the mobile network data, the data that is uh, collected by the mobile network infrastructure. And then we have a big area called Big Data for Social Good, where we are investigating the value of this data for uh, improving the world. And I will present one project on that topic. So without further ado, we've gotten a lot of papers, and we've also we've appeared many times in the press. You can just look on the web. I will present three projects that try to answer this question, which is the underlying question for many of the projects that we work on, which is, can mobile phones be used to model, understand, and ultimately help their users, both individually and at large? So I'll start with the first project, which is about boredom, which falls into this area here. And before I start, and this probably you all know, and you've been here for a week or, or more, uh, so many other people probably have told you, um, the mobile phone is an incredibly powerful and interesting device for this new area of computational social sciences, or for trying to understand human behavior. Because there are more phones than people in the world, because mobile penetration is pretty much 100% everywhere in the world right now, because we love our phones, we spend more time with our phones than with anyone or with any other thing in our lives. And uh, as opposed to, say, glasses, which you know, we, we might say, OK, we wear glasses all the time, mobile phones are connected and have computation power and have sensors. You know, and glasses, uh, at least until now, you know, they are passive you know, uh, devices. And a very interesting uh, phenomenon is that this is a global phenomenon. So this is not something that is only happening in the developed world, but it's happening everywhere. So all of these characteristics make the mobile phone a unique element to try to understand human behavior. So the first project is leveraging the fact that we love our mobile phone, and it's always with us. And this is joint work with Martin, Tillman, and Jose. And it's a project on seeing if we can detect automatically, using machine learning, if you are bored when you're using your phone. And the motivation for this project is that we are all subjects of a war on attention. There are many competing services that are trying to grab our attention. And our attention has become a currency that different companies you know, are trying to sort of like grab. And we make a trade between services that we use for free and in exchange, you know, we pay attention to these services and particularly to the ads, you know, that these services show. And this has been pretty much, it's a simplification, but it's a big part of the internet uh, economy today. So something that has happened in the past few years is that the way that mobile services are trying to grab our attention is through push notifications. And this is something that didn't happen, you know, say 10 years ago where you know, they are trying to um, send all these notifications precisely to grab our attention in such a way that what we are experiencing right now is a deluge of notifications. And in fact, uh, some studies show that people receive between 150 and 200 notifications a day or something like that. So and I think you all probably experience this um, a notification overload you know, that we are experiencing. Um, and this is not just an observation that we've made. Other authors have made this observation. In fact, Daven, Davenport and Beck in 2001 talk about the attention economy, uh, about this idea of treating human attention as a scarce resource that we need to somehow manage. And the situation that we have now is a little bit similar to what happened in the Wild West. When people were promised the Wild West, you could go there and grab a piece of land, and it was your piece of land. And now it's similar with our attention. We are in a situation where any app or any service can sort of like try to grab our attention in a sort of uncoordinated and aggressive way. Uh, so one of our motivations is, could we do better than this? Could we design services that help people make better use of their attention and that alleviate this deluge of notifications that we are receiving today? And a key question that we try to answer in this project is, could boredom be part of the solution. And why are we talking about boredom? Because even though I've said that attention is a scarce resource, attention is not always a scarce. In fact, there is an emotional state that we are all in 
sometimes in the day or, you know, or every few days, called boredom, which by definition is an emotional state of under-stimulation, where people are actively trying to find new stimuli to pay attention to. So it's a state where people are actually actively looking for stimuli. Another observation, uh, also based in, in recent work, is that there has been some previous work finding that mobile phones are usually uh, used by people when they're trying to kill time. So, and I think many of you will empathize with this, we are losing the ability of just doing nothing, or just being with ourselves. And as soon as we have 30 seconds of doing nothing, we are stopped in a traffic light, we are in the bus, we are waiting for something, we pull out our phones, and then we just iterate through a number of apps to see if there is anything interesting there. So we might go to Facebook, then we might check our email, then we go to like Twitter, and then we check this um, uh, you know, uh, site, and then we go back and we do this because we are sort of like self-stimulating and looking for something interesting. So the question that we try to answer is, if my phone knew when I am in this mode of killing time, when I'm not really doing anything particularly useful with it, could they actually suggest a better use of that time? Or could, they, could it actually help me deal better with that situation? So in order to answer that question, we formulated uh, this other question, which is, could we detect boredom from how people are using their phones? Could I determine whether you are bored or not bored when you are using your phone at every instant of time? And to do this, we made an app that we call Bored App, which is, uh, which is a pretty useless app in the sense that it's, not a, it's, an, it's a, a purely scientific experimental app. It's an app to collect data. And we put it on Google Play, and we recruited people uh, to participate in the study. And what this app does is, on the one hand, it collects as much contextual information as possible about what the person is doing. So it has some sensors on the phone that are being used all the time, like the battery status or the amount of notifications that you have and so forth. And there are some other sensors that are only used when the phone is active to save battery. And this is the amount of data that you're transmitting, um, the uh, 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 sort of like the amount of ambient noise that there is, the amount of light, the app that you're using in the foreground, etc. And then BoardApp uses a very well-known methodology in human-computer interaction called experience sampling. Have you heard of experience sampling? Okay. So experience sampling is a methodology used to collect feedback from people in situ. So for this project, what we need is, on the one hand, to have data about the context of people using their phones. But on the other hand, we need to know whether people are bored or not bored when they are using their phones. So we have a data set that contains the ground truth, what is called the ground truth. So then I would have a data set where I would know this person is bored, and this is the patterns of usage. This person is not bored, and these are the patterns of usage. And I can use this to feed to different machine learning algorithms to build a model of what does it mean to be bored. So how do I know? if people are bored. So the only way really to know is to ask them. So how do I ask them if they're bored? So I can use experience sampling. So what Borab does is multiple times a day, it pops out a, a notification, a question, where it asks you, do you feel bored right now or not? And then you answer that question. And because it also has all the contextual information that I presented before, then <coughs> We have both the context and the ground truth, and that's what we can use for the machine learning models to train a model of boredom. So in this case, in this project, we ask people to fill out this questionnaire, this simple question, at least six times a day. So the important thing about experience sampling is that it collects the ground truth in situ. Traditionally, in human-computer interaction, if you wanted to do something like this, what people were doing was taking volunteers to a lab. And they will just sit them in the lab, and they will be there for three hours, and they will subject them to something, and then they will ask them, in this case, are you bored or are you not bored? But obviously, this has a lot of limitations. So experience sampling came to be as a way to collect the feedback in situ, to collect the feedback in the real world. So people don't have to come to the lab. They are using their normal phone. They are living you know, their normal life, and then they get asked these questions. Yes? Only on the phone and not on the full experience of boredom. 
Yeah, so that's a good question. So obviously, if, uh, if we are trying to infer, um, what we are trying to infer is when you are using your phone, distinguish between the times that you're using your phone because you're bored and the times because you're not bored. So it could be that you're bored, uh, but you're not using your phone. But in that case, the phone wouldn't, the, uh, the phone did, wouldn't do anything. Like, so what I want to know is when you're using your phone, are you using it because you're doing something useful or are you using it because you're killing time? So in that context, they check on X amount of time which pop up on But I don't answer it. Yeah. Maybe X plus delta amount of time after some time I answer it. So that the, the time of boredom is not actually captured then. So 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 the, the answer of, so boredom is an instantaneous state, it's an emotional state that changes relatively quickly. So I would, we would collect the information from whenever people answer, and we will have the contextual information of the phone at that point. And we will make the hypothesis that you know, they're related. As you will see in the results, the, the system is not perfect, because the ground truth is not perfect. And as you say, there are many other reasons why you could be bored, or there are many other uh, you know, factors that could play a role. But it is useful to a certain degree. So I'll, I'll explain that next. So what we did was we did a user study. We collected 54 people uh, advertising through uh, different networks, people that we didn't know at all. Um, and then for two weeks, they used Borap. And they provided us with all this, both the sensor information and the contextual information from the phone, and also the self-reports of boredom, which was uh, almost 4,400 self-reports of boredom. When we look at the ground truth, um, this is the histogram of the amount of, of the frequency of the different answers, where zero is I'm not bored at all, and four is I'm very bored right now. Uh, this is a common five-point Likert scale, and as you see, People are generally not bored, so it's an unbalanced data set. There are many more instances of not being bored than of being bored. Yeah, so then what we do to compensate for this bias is that you, what you can do is normalize the data in a way that for each individual, you compute the z-score, and then you consider if they are bored, if the z-score is greater than 0.25, and in that way, you have a little bit of a more balanced data set. In any case, people tend to be not bored. Uh, it's, it's not that you're bored half of the time. Usually you are less bored than bored normally. But this is good enough. This is already enough examples to be able to train a machine learning algorithm. We computed 35 features in seven different categories. A lot of them are related to usage. Either, um, and we classify the usage into sort of like four types. One, which is intensity of usage, which is just the amount of bytes that you're being uh, receiving on the phone. Usage that is externally triggered through notifications. Usage that is based on using apps and how many apps you're using. And then the type of app that you're using. And then we have other three uh, types of features. One, which we call contextual, where we only use a very rough sense of location. So we don't use the GPS location of the phone for privacy reasons. We have some demographics only if people provided them. Not everyone provided the demographics when they sign in. And then we have information about the last uh, incoming and outgoing uh, phone calls. So the first question is, how well can we detect boredom? So we have now this data set where we have all the data for these 54 people, both how they are using their phone and the ground truth on whether they are bored or they are not bored. So this is a relatively straightforward machine learning um, sort of like approach to try to answer this question. And it would be um, a simple binary classifier where what you need to do is to make a system that will tell you are you bored or you're not bored, so zero or one. So we used a supervised machine learning. We tried different state-of-the-art models like linear SVMs, random forests, or logistic regression. We use five-fold cross-validation, and in terms of performance, we use three metrics. We measure both precision and recall, but also we measure the area under the ROC curve. And these are the results that we got. So we use two different uh, sets of ground truth. The absolute ground truth, which was this very unbalanced data set, as I mentioned, where there was only about 10% of instances of boredom, and most of them were not bored. And then the normalized uh, boredom, 
using the z-score, which was a little bit more balanced. And this is the, the outlook for the models. So if we use the absolute ground truth, we had about 83% performance. And if we use the normalized ground truth, we had about 75% performance in, in correctly determining if uh, you were bored or not. When we look at the precision and recall performance, we see uh, before that uh, these data sets, remember it, we'll call it the primary data set, the data set using the normalized um, ground truth, because we will use it later. When we look at precision and recall, the system can detect 50% of the boredom events with about 63% precision. So it's not perfect, it's far from perfect. But it can actually do something significantly better than random. So the first takeaway is yes, it seems that we are able to detect if a person is bored or not from how they use their form with an, an accuracy between 70 and 80%, more or less. So the second question is, are there specific usage patterns or other specific features that are more correlated with being bored than others? So when we look at the different features that we used, then we look at the strength of the correlation with being bored. And we found um, some interesting results. For example, in terms of the recency of the communication activity, there is um, a difference between if you are making the phone call or if you are receiving a phone call. So the more bored you are, the less time has passed since you are making a phone call, but the more time has passed since you are receiving a phone call. So this is very interesting. It that there is a, an asymmetry between you making phone calls and being bored or you receiving phone, phone calls and feeling bored. In terms of the time of the day and the, uh, and the, the amount of light, it seems that we get more bored as the day progresses. So the more bored you are, the later in the day it is. When we look at gender, there is a slight uh, impact of gender. And uh, in our data set, we found that the more bored you are, the, if, the, the, if you are male, than if you are female, slightly. When we look at usage intensity, we found some weak um, correlations. And then when we look at the um, intensity of recent usage, we also find some um, you know, weak correlations. We also look at the types of apps. And we found a clustering of apps uh, distinguishing them between whether you were bored or you were not bored. And this was actually surprising to me. So we found that, um, we found that social apps like uh, instant messaging apps and Facebook tend to co-occur when we are not bored, whereas email and other types of apps tend to co-occur when we are bored. And uh, this is what I, I would imagine that these are more when you are bored and you just try to like talk to your friends, but it turns out that you know it's the other way around. So the second takeaway is that boredom is related to the recency of the communication, to the demographics, to the intensity of usage, and to the types of apps that you're using. And the third question, which is the most important question, is, is this good enough for anything? Because as I mentioned, the model is not perfect. It's far from perfect. So can we actually use it for anything uh, useful? So to validate or to answer that question, we did a second study, which we call Board App 2. And there was a second app. And what this app does, it actually now it does something for uh, people. The first one didn't really do anything. It was just to collect data. And this one, it has board, it has a model running all the time, this app, trying to determine whether you are bored or not. And this is the model that was trained using the primary data set, the data set with the normalized ground truth. And then it's constantly inferring whether you are bored or not. And then what the app does is it suggests people to read BuzzFeed articles. Have you heard of BuzzFeed, any of you? It's sort of like a social site that recommends you interesting news that are popular. Uh, so what Board Up 2 does is it shows you these notifications telling you, are you bored? Then click here if you want to read. And this news here change, changes every time. So we did a second study with 16 people. And they were different from the, first, from the people in the first study. These were completely different people. They used Board Up 2 for two weeks. They received about 950 recommendations. And about half of them were suggested to people when the app thought that they were bored. And the other half were suggested to people when the app thought that they were not bored. And, uh, there, and the question is, is there any difference 
in the likelihood of people to click on the recommendation depending on whether they are bored or not. And we actually found quite surprising results. We, we, me we measured two things, what we call the click ratio and the engagement ratio. The click ratio is the fraction of times that people clicked on the notification. And what we found was only 8% of the time people clicked on the notification when the app thought that they were not bored, whereas all over 20% of the time they clicked on the notification when the app thought that they were bored. And this difference is significant with a large effect. So what we found is even if we have an imperfect model, when our imperfect model thought that people were bored, people were significantly more likely to click on a recommendation than when, when they were not bored. But we also measure the engagement uh, factor, which it me measures not just whether you click in the notification or not, but if you stay there for more than 30 seconds. Because one difference is clicking, another one is, is actually reading the, the recommendation. And there we also found a significant effect. So only 4% of the time people were staying for more than 30 seconds when they were not bored, and 15% of the time they were doing it when they were bored. And this difference is also significant. So this was actually quite, on the one hand, surprising, or on the other hand, encouraging to us, because even such a sort of like imperfect model is able to uh, very significantly uh, discriminate for something useful. You know, in this case, it would be for recommending uh, you know, news to people. So to summarize, when our app thought that people were bored, participants were more likely to click on the recommendation and more likely to read it for, 30 seconds, for more than 30 seconds. So the third takeaway is that this model is actually um, useful to uh, have a significant effect both on clicking and on engagement in recommended content. So this project we presented at UBCOM, uh, the, uh, the last UBCOM in September in 2015. We actually won Best Paper Award and it had a lot of impact on the press. Uh, but for us, the most important thing is, okay, what can we do if we have a model that is able to detect boredom on the phone? And we have four potential uh, application scenarios. The first one is to recommend content, which is similar to the scenario that we tested in the second user study. So you could, if, you, if your phone knew that you were bored, it could recommend you relevant content you know, that you might, may be interested in consuming. Another interesting scenario would be to turn it around and to say, well, if I know that the person is not bored, maybe I could shield the person from non-important interruptions. Uh, right now, there is no filtering at all. Uh, but could we use this information to, to help people filter um, annoying you know, interruptions or notifications when the system knows that they are not bored and that they are engaged on some, doing something? Another idea would be to recommend um, activities or actions that you might want to do, but that you somehow never find the time to do. For example, if you are trying to learn a language, maybe the phone could like suggest you to practice you know, your language when it detects that you're bored. Or if you have a to-do list, for example, call my grandmother or make an appointment to the dentist or do something like this, maybe these are things that could suggest to you when you are bored. Because many times we forget all these things and only when it's the worst of times you know, we remember them. And the last and probably most controversial um, use case would be that the phone could actually suggest you to embrace boredom. And maybe it could recommend you to turn it off and to say, well, I'm detecting that you're bored and maybe you should turn me off because you're not doing anything useful with me right now. And maybe you should just look out of the window and, and, and see what kind of a day we have. And this is, to me, very interesting because I don't see anyone designing technology that would help regulate the usage of the technology. But uh, this doesn't necessarily mean that this is the best for us as individuals. And in fact, boredom is correlated with creativity. And if we lose the ability of being bored because we are constantly being stimulated, we might lose our creativity or we might lose some of our creative output. So I think it would be very interesting to see what happens if we design technology that is helping us regulate the usage you know, of that technology in sort of in a positive way. These are some of the papers uh, about the project, if you are interested in reading it. 
So now I'm going to move to the second project. Um, I think I'm going to give them the choice. Uh, because I don't think I'm going to have time to present both projects. So the next project is a project also on individual modeling, on inferring credit score, your credit score from how you use your phone. And this is very relevant in developing countries where there are many people that are unbanked. And the last project is a project on predicting crime in a metropolitan area. And that project is about using large-scale aggregate data. So not individual data, but aggregate data. So raise your hands, the ones that are interested in this one, please. Okay. And what about the other one? Okay, so the crime wins. Okay, so I'll go to crime. So this one, if you're interested, we have a few publications. You can look at it. I'll just quickly go to the bottom. But actually, before I do that, I'm going to explain to you um, mobile data because this is important. So we can use the phone to model people individually. But we can also use the phone to model people as a, as a city or as a region or as a country. Because, as I said, all of us have mobile phones and the mobile phones are connected. So what kind of data do we use if we are modeling people at large? So in my case, working for a telecommunications company, we use data that is collected by the telecommunications infrastructure, in particular by the mobile network infrastructure. So this is an illustration of how a mobile phone would see the world. So usually in the world there are cell towers, and I think you've seen many of them. Uh, in, you can see them in cities. And typically, and this is a simplification, but the phone is connected to a cell tower at a time, and as you move through space, uh, the phone switches from one cell tower to the next. So generally, if you know where the cell towers are, you can do this, which is called a Voronoi tessellation of the space, where you have in each of these cells a cell tower, and this could be a rough approximation of the area of coverage of that cell tower. So then, you know, if you're here, this will be the area of coverage. So you don't know exactly where the person is. You only know that it's connected to this cell tower. And then if you move here, then you're connected to this cell tower, etc. So the geographic granularity is not very good because it's at the area of coverage level, which could be 100 meter by 100 meter to a few kilometers by a few kilometers if it's a rural area. So you have a rough idea of you know, um, where the phone is, um, but not an exact um, location. So the typical data that is used for many, for many studies are called CDRs. Are you familiar with CDRs, any of you? No? OK. So CDRs means called detailed records. And this is the, one of the most basic uh, type of data. It's an event-driven type of data, meaning that it only is collected when there is an event happening. And that event is either making a phone call or uh, receiving a phone call, make, sending an SMS or receiving an SMS. And then typically what you have is a timestamp, then the encrypted originating and destination numbers, the ID of the cell towers of the or, uh, originating and destination phones, only if they are part of the same mobile network. Otherwise, you only see one of them. And then the duration of the phone call, and then there is other information that is usually not relevant. For the SMSs, it's the same, but you don't have the duration. There is absolutely no content, obviously. There is only these sort of like events. From these events, usually, you can compute three types of variables. You can compute consumption-related variables, which measure the amount of phone calls happening uh, in a cell tower, the duration of all the phone calls, the amount of unique phone calls, the amount of incoming phone calls, the amount of outgoing phone calls, etc. So consumption-related variables. You can compute social network variables because you can build a graph of all the uh, originating and destination numbers and see how they are connected. And then you can apply any kind of uh, graph metric to characterize that graph. And then you can compute sun mobility, not very accurate, as I mentioned, at the cell tower level. But you can have a rough estimation of what is called the radius of gyration, which is the radius of a uh, circumference that covers most of the cell towers, that a phone is moving around, an estimation of the travel distance, which ones are the most popular antennas that people are connected to, etc. So this is sort of like a very quick primer on the type of data that we use. Uh, and then I'll move to, the, um, to here. So with this data, um, there has been actually um, 
Uh, this is a, a, a sort of like a research area that has been growing over the past years, probably since, I don't know, I would say emerging in 2008, probably until now, it's, now it's become very, very popular. And in fact, in 2013, um, MIT Technology Review highlighted this idea of leveraging this data from phones, which is very big data in an aggregate form, as a breakthrough technology to understand human behavior and is one of the important data sets in computational social sciences. And there has been a lot of projects from different teams on how we can use this type of data to understand different aspects of human behavior. If you are interested in knowing more about this data, there have been a number of public competitions where um, anonymized and aggregated data of this type has been shared. One of the more popular ones is called D4D, D number four and D, which was a competition organized by Orange Telecom, which is a very large telco, and they shared data in two different years from Ivory Coast and then from Senegal. And it was, a, it was a competition on how to use this data for social good. So you can uh, check mm, the types of projects that, had the, that were done. There were many, many teams from all over the world that analyzed that data and that tried to do something useful with the data in the context of understanding migrations or determining violence or determining uh, uh, socioeconomic development, etc. So I'll show you a couple of videos of how this data looks so you get an idea of how this is very coarse data, but when you have it aggregated in a region, it actually carries interesting information. This is a visualization of the activity in the cell towers in Mexico before, during, and after an earthquake. So the brighter and the bigger the circle, the larger the number of phone calls that a particular cell tower is handling. And then you, the, the epicenter of the earthquake is here. And then you will see when the, when the earthquake takes place, there is this surge of activity. So that surge of activity would enable us to have a sense of roughly how many people there are in different parts. And this is very important because when the government or the Red Cross uh, need to send help to the area affected by the earthquake, they need to know roughly how many people have been affected and where there are these affected people. And if we can use this data for that, that could be extremely helpful. When you look at the movement of the uh, phones, this is a sample of a million phones in the UK, then you start seeing a little bit some patterns of mobility. You see the largest cities, you see the routes between the cities, and so forth. So again, it's very coarse data, it's very um, sort of like large scale, but the fact that you have it for a lot of people over a certain amount of, uh, of time is what enables to draw some conclusions about uh, human behavior. So uh, in, in the team, we've been working in this area for a few years now. We've done a number of projects in the context of pandemics to infer socioeconomic levels, to detect areas that are affected by floodings. This was a collaboration with the United Nations and the government of Mexico. And the project that I'm going to present is to predict crime, which is in collaboration with the University of Trento, FBK, and MIT in particular with Andrei Bogomolov, Bruno Lepri, Jacopo Stagliano, uh, Fabio Pianesi, and Sandy Pentland. And this project actually was the winner of a datathon for social good that we organized a couple of years ago. So crime, as you probably all know, affects the quality of life in our region. There have been a lot of studies trying to understand the relationships between crime and different sort of like census type variables. Uh, socioeconomic variables like education, income, unemployment, ethnicity. And there are two um, different ways you can study crime. You can try to study crime at an individual level, trying to determine if a particular individual is going to commit a crime. But in the literature, what they have found is that they tend to be significant concentrations of crime in a small geographic areas. And these are typically called crime hotspots. And this is a place-centric approach to crime, where the goal is not, not to predict if a certain individual is going to commit a crime, but to determine whether a certain area is going to be a crime hotspot or not. And this is what we try to do in this project. When we look at the relationship between crime and the urban environment, there have been many theories, but I'll just um, highlight two um, sort of like opposite, opposite theories uh, that have been proposed. One of them 
is by Jane Jacobs in the 60s. She was a social activist in the US. And she talked about what characteristics will make a city be dynamic and have vitality. And she talked about diversity. She wrote, uh, she talked about this concept of eyes on the street. And what she says is that if you have an area that has a lot of diversity and that has a lot of different types of people moving through the area, we all act as policemen to each other and then it should be a safer area because we, there's always someone there and then people would like be, see if someone is being attacked or something and they would protect each other. So according to this theory, the higher the amount of diversity and the higher the number of visitors, the less crime you would have in a region. But then about 10 years later, Newman proposed a, the opposite theory called the defensible space theory, where he said that um, if you have an area that has a lot of diversity and a lot of visitors, then it's more anonymous because people don't know each other, and then it would lead to more crime. And areas where everyone knows each other and they're close communities, they should be safer because everyone knows each other, and then they would detect immediately if someone is not from the community and they would like protect each other. So one question is, who is right? Because they seem to be saying the opposite. And uh, what is exciting today is that a lot of these social sciences theories, we haven't been able to corroborate them in the large scale until now. Because we haven't had access to human behavioral data in the large scale until now. So now it's very exciting because there is this intersection between computer science and social sciences, and we are able to validate to a certain degree a lot of these theories with quantitative data. And this is one of the uh, objectives of this project. So as I mentioned before, when you're trying to build models of crime, you can focus on people, or you can focus on places. And um, in this project, we focus on, on places. So we are trying to determine whether a certain part of the space is going to be a hotspot or not of crime. Um, the particular area for this project is uh, London's metropolitan area. And the goal is to see if we can determine crime hotspots from a variety of data. And I will explain the type of data now. In particular, we use two different data sets as the input, and then one data set as the ground truth. The ground truth is coming from the London police, and is the criminal cases data set, where we have the amount of crimes geolocated for the metropolitan area of London, but aggregated per month. So we have all the crimes that took place in December and all the crimes that took place in January. As I mentioned, this project um, was part of a data fund for social good that Telefonica organized in collaboration with the Open Data Institute. So this data set and this data set came uh, through the Open Data Institute. This is a typical census data set, the London Borough Profiles data set. And what it has is 68 metrics, which are census types of metrics that are being collected by pretty much every country, every government in the world about the characteristics you know, of, the, of any particular geographic area. And I will explain each data set better later. And then this is the mobile, the data coming from the mobile network. So let's look at each data set. The, mo the data coming from the mobile network, it wasn't, it wasn't exactly uh, the same as the, the, as the type of data that I presented before, but it's very similar. It's coming from a product called Smart Steps, where it divides the space into a grid. Instead of being this Voronoi tessellation that I showed, where the cells were irregularly shaped, here is they're all square. But the size of the square depends on the density of cell towers. So in rural areas, the square is very big, because there is only one cell tower for a large area. And then in urban areas, the squares are very small because there are a lot of cell towers. And this product already provides for each cell, for each of these cells, every hour, every day, and every week, and every month, an estimate on the number of people that are there. And in particular, in addition to telling you more or less how many people are there, they tell you of all these people, what percentage of these people, this is their home, this is their work, and they are just visitors, an estimation of their gender and an estimation of their, of their age. These two variables come from a market research company that also uh, collaborated, and that market research companies, that's what they do for specific geographic areas. They carry a lot, a lot of surveys, and they try to figure out what are the demographics of the people uh, living there. So this is obviously not coming from 
the activity in the mobile network, but this is coming from the activity in the mobile network. The crime data, as I explained, is aggregated per month. So for every month, it has all the reported crimes um, geolocated. Because we wanted to compute hotspots, what we did is we computed the median amount of uh, crimes per area, which was five, and then we used this as the threshold to determine whether an area was a hotspot if it, if it had more than five crimes, or if it was not a hotspot if it had less or equal than five crimes. And the spatial granularity is called the LSOA, which are the small geographic areas defined by the British Office of National Statistics, and they're areas that have a mean population of 1,500. So we had to map these squares to these LSOA areas, which look like this. So this is the geographic split that we did. So for each of these LSOEs, we had both the number of crimes each month, and we had the census data, which were 68 metrics that were telling us for each of these little regions, information about the demographics, the households, how many migrants there were, how many unemployed people there were, how happy people were, how much they made, what was the life expectancy, etc. And this is all information that governments collect when they do the census, which they typically do it every 10 years. They collect all this information in very detailed terms. So for each of these cells, then what we had was the amount of crimes, the number of crimes, the census information, and then an estimation every hour, um, every day, every week, and every month on the number of people that were there. And that was coming from the mobile network. So then what we did was, the, t the, the challenge is using the information coming from the mobile network or using the information from the census, can we predict if each of these regions is going to be a crime hotspot or not the next month? So to do this, again, applying machine learning, what you do is you compute a number of features for each of these regions, either the census features, the 68 features, or mobile activity features. Then you have the ground truth on whether this has, this has had crimes or not. And then you train a classifier, and then you apply this classifier to predict the crime the next month. And that's what we did. So in terms of the features from the mobile data, we computed a lot of features. We computed all the features that they provided uh, us with, the number of people, how many were visitors, how many were at home, uh, their gender, their ages, but then we also computed a lot of first order and second order statistics of, of these features using very different time windows. So something very important is that this data is a spatial temporal data. It has a location and then it has, it changes over time. So for each problem, you don't know what is the right temporal scale that you should use. So typically what you do is you compute features at all, at all possible temporal scales, and then you apply feature selection to figure out which temporal scale would work the best. And that's what we did. So we ended up with over 6,000 features, and then we applied, you can apply any type of feature selection uh, algorithm that you want. In this case, we use the mean decreasing Gini coefficient uh, to, to end with 68 features. So we reduced the dimensionality from 6,000 features to 68 features. And we chose 68 features to have a model that would be the same complexity as the census model, because there were 68 census variables. So then what we did was we built three classifiers. We built one classifier that was using the features coming from the census. We built another classifier that was using the features coming from the mobile data. And then we built a classifier that was using the features from both. Uh, in, in all cases, to predict crime in each region. We tried different classifiers, and the one that worked the best were random forests. And these are the results. We also compare with a simple baseline just for illustration purposes. So when we only use the census features, we got about 62% accuracy. When we use the mobile features, we got 68% accuracy, and we combined them, we got almost 70% accuracy. So Something that was very surprising is that only using the mobile features, you could do better than using these very detailed census features that are so costly to collect. This is a visualization of the results, but it's difficult to see the mistakes, uh, really. Um, 
And what is interesting is to look at which, at which features are important to see if Jane Jacobs or, uh, or Neumann was right. So what we found was that daily dynamics were, in terms of the temporal scale, daily dynamics were the, the features that were being selected. As you remember, we computed at monthly scale, weekly scale, hourly scale, da daily scale, and the daily features seem to be the most important ones. And then we found two types of features that seem to corroborate Jane Jacobs' theory. The first one was that if you had a high number of residents, you tended to have more crime, which contrasts Newman's theories. So we found that the higher the number of residents in an area, the more likely that area was to have more crime. And then we found, uh, we computed a lot of entropy features because entropy has been found to be uh, predictive of different aspects of human behavior, also in the literature. For example, to predict your personality or to infer different aspects of behavior, entropy seems to be important. So we computed entropy features as well from the mobile data, and we found that they were very useful to predict the, the crime hotspots, and what we found was that the higher the entropy in, for example, the home variables and the work variables or the gender of people or the age of people, the, the lower the crime. And that was really supporting Jane Jacobs' theory. It seemed that the higher the diversity in an area, the lower the crime in that area. When we look at the um, uh, combined model, the model that was using both the census data and the mobile data, it was very interesting to see that only six out of 68 features in the joint model were coming from the census. And the rest of the features were coming from the mobile, from the dynamics, from the mobile network. And in particular, the census variables that seemed to matter a lot were related to people being born abroad, people that were un unemployed, migrants, and so forth. So I think some of the important implications of this work was that we, for the first time, were able to look at the value of human dynamics in predicting crime and at the variables that play a role and to corroborate or not some of the existing social science theories on you know, what characteristics of an urban space increase or decrease crime. And these are some of the publications for this work. We are now trying to develop this work further and see if we can corroborate the results in a different country because this was just an example uh, in a particular metropolitan area with a particular data set. So one of the challenges is to see how generalizable these results are and if we can actually uh, replicate these results uh, in other places. So just to conclude, uh, I think the most important message is uh, to realize that mobile phones have huge potential to help us, both individually and in aggregate form. Um, but th there are still a, a lot of challenges that is what make this a very fertile field for research. And maybe some of you are interested in, in, uh, in going in this direction. Um, one of the challenges which I mentioned now when I mentioned the crime project is the generalization ability of the data and how representative the data is. So in this case, we were using data from one particular mobile operator, which maybe has 30% or 40% of the market share. So you're still only seeing you know, 30 or 40% of the population. So you need to figure out whether this actually generalizes to everyone else. A big challenge is how to combine data for multiple sources. I just mentioned briefly how the representation of the mobile data was agreed and the representation of the census data were these LSOA regions and you have to find the mapping. So how you combine data from different sources is always difficult. The data is going to be coming with different time scales, it's going to come with different spatial resolutions and you have to figure out uh, how to map them. None of the projects that have, well, well, the Borden project is in real time, but most of the projects in computational social sciences, when you talk at large scale, are very rarely done in real time. Because getting access to this data is already very complicated and is generally not available in real time. But if you, for many of the use cases, if you want to help, you need to be able to do the analysis in real time. For example, if there is a natural disaster, you want to be able to analyze the data in real time and provide feedback in real time. So a big challenge is how to be able to do this in real time. Another big challenge is that we don't have a lot of ground truth because the ground truth is the world itself and, that's, and, and 
what we are saying is that we cannot measure the world because it's too large and it's too complicated. So how do you validate a lot of these results is difficult. And usually the best validation would be to be able to do an intervention, to be able to make a decision based on the results of the analysis and then see what happens in the real world. But that's obviously difficult to do. In the context of smartphones and the boredom project, a very big challenge is more related to human-computer interaction. It's like once you have some intelligence in the phone, determining the best way to provide value back to the person in the most friendly and not annoying way is a very difficult uh, challenge. For some of the projects, there might be some regulatory barriers because we are using data sources that were not designed to be used for computational purposes, so the regulation in some countries is still behind. And then, even though the data is largely aggregated and anonymized, there might be some unintended consequences that could uh, appear from the analysis of this data. And I can just give you an illustration. In this D4D challenge that I mentioned earlier, there has been two editions, as I mentioned, one in Ivory Coast and a couple of years later in Senegal. And what they found, the organizers found, that when they organized the challenge in Ivory Coast, some of the projects could have an unintended consequence because um, if we are talking about data from countries that are not democratic, that are maybe run by a particular ethnic group or by a particular political group that happens to hate another ethnic group, and it turns out that with this data, you can actually model the mobility of people in certain regions, or you can model the migrations of people in certain ethnic group. If this analysis would fall in the hands of some you know, uh, people, they could target you know, those people. So in the second edition of the challenge, they created an ethics panel to assess if there could be any unintended consequences of some of the projects, and then talk to the authors of these projects and discuss with them you know, potential unintended consequences. And actually, I was one of the members of this ethics panel, and it was very interesting to see, because even very well-intentioned activities, like doing this large datathon for social good, and even very well-intended projects that were really meaning to be for social good, they could have some unintended consequence you know, that no one really anticipated. So this is all, uh, and now I think we have time for questions. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so, so the socioeconomic status of the area was one of the variables, but it was not selected by the joint model. The variables that were selected by the joint model were more related to unemployment and to the amount of uh, migrants in the area and people um, receiving a specific aid because of being migrants, but not necessarily related to the socioeconomic status uh, per se, which was one of the variables is the socioeconomic level, yeah. Mm. Yes? So, so there is a lot of different types of crime. Um, so for this project, I think we only took the violent crimes. So they, they, there is a taxonomy of crimes. There is violent crimes and non-violent crimes. And then in the non-violent, there is robberies and thefts. And but was it collected based on the number of arrests? It was provided by the police, okay. by the London police. Okay. So the London police classifies every reported crime using a taxonomy that they have on if it's violent, if it's not violent, and in violent, I don't know, murder, or whatever, I don't know the, <laughs> the names. Uh. My follow-up question, like this sort of study in the US um, could raise flags in terms of discrimination. Do you think the number of crimes being reported by the police are already largely discriminatory against certain marginalized yeah. The ground truth, yeah. So I don't know if you heard the question. So she's talking about potential biases in the ground truth of the crime data because in some countries it's been shown 
that the ground truth on reported crimes has a bias towards certain populations. So I don't know how it is in London. I mean, in theory, it seems neutral in the sense that the crime has to be reported. If there is unreported crime, uh, the police doesn't know. But I think if it is reported, they, I mean, for example, I think the US is a very clear case, but in Europe, I'm not aware that there is such a big bias towards certain, um, uh, we didn't, uh, we, we, the thing is, we don't know anything about the individuals that commit the crimes. It's just the location of the crime and the type of crime, but nothing about the individuals. So we couldn't really know if there's any kind of bias there. Yes? Yeah, so that's a very good question. So we are now actually um, carrying out a much larger second study precisely to see how well um, it would generalize to a larger population. So the target for the second study is a few hundred people because this is very preliminary results, I agree with you. Having such a small sample, even though the results were statistically significant, is a very small sample. So being aware of that, the next step is to be able to do a larger scale. Uh, so I think this has to be taking us promising first results, but obviously with you know, 54 people or you know, 16 people, you can't make large claims you know, about much. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So this is all about urban life and the theories that I mentioned, Jane Jacobs and Newman are about urban cities and urban life. So we haven't done anything on rural areas because the project that we are doing right now is also on a big city. Uh, so I really have no experience on rural areas. One of the challenges for rural areas might be collecting the ground truth because I'm not sure how most large cities, their police departments are fairly computerized right now, and they have pretty good records of you know, the amount of crime or, the, or different variables that happen. But I don't know how well covered that is in rural areas. They are through, it's all self-reported questionnaires. So this is how census, the census is generated. Well, so the, so, so the, so the self-reported, so this is considered to be the gold standard today. This was, has been used since, I don't know, the last 100 years. Is the only way that we have had so far to understand uh, different aspects of a population. Uh, can, all countries in the world make censuses still today using pretty much the same tools that they've been using for a long time, which are specific questionnaires that they have validated. So for happiness, they used uh, sort of like validated self-reported questionnaire of happiness. But... <laughs> Well, that's what the, so that was the intuition, but we need the ground truth. So it's the same as with happiness. There are many target variables that you need to ask the person. I cannot make a system that makes up he's bored because he's doing like this with the phone. Because, I don't know, maybe you read really fast, you know? And, uh, so the only way is to ask people. So as much as asking people might have biases, because you say, oh, maybe the person is really unhappy, but they say they're happy. Or maybe the person is really bored, but just for the fun of it, they say that they are not bored. You know, all of these 
could happen, but it's as good as we can do because there is no other way that I can know if, if you are bored, except for asking you, are you bored and hoping that you are going to be honest because you agreed to participate in the study and hopefully it's because you, know, you want to help science, not because you want to... So what we are doing in the second study, so the second study is doing something else, which is it's asking people whether they are bored, but also it's asking people, it's giving people the option, it's not just stopping there, it's giving people the option to sort of like get entertainment, either by doing something fun or by doing something that makes you think. And we are trying to see if through this implicit measure, we might be able to determine different levels of boredom or different types of boredom, in addition to asking people, are you bored or not? Because we need to ask the people. We cannot just make it up. Yeah, yeah, I, I know. But in most of them, you need either you have ground truth or you do an intervention once you have the system running, and then you show that it's actually working. But you cannot just make it up and then say, OK, it's, it's working because, uh, because my system says that it's working, you know? <laughs> OK, thank you. OK, so the, the way the data was collected is you were running the app, the first board app app. The app in the background is collecting a lot of information about the status of the phone and the status of the vibration mode and the amount of data that you're transmitting and so forth. And then at least six times a day, the app pops up a notification and it asks you, are you bored? And then you need to answer. And that's, that's how we collect the ground truth. Okay, so it's popping up randomly. Yes, randomly. Well, in experience sampling, it's randomly, but you try to make it in a way that, for example, there has to be a certain spacing between probes. So I cannot ask you six times within five minutes. You know, usually you space it equally throughout the day. There are certain rules that you apply, but it's at random points in the day. And we did that for at least two weeks for each person. And then, so then we have a data set that has all the, all the information about how you are using the phone and the ground truth of whether you are bored or not. And then we use that to train a classifier that would automatically find which patterns in the usage of the phone are correlated with being bored and which ones are correlated with not being bored. And then once you have the model trained, you don't have the ground truth anymore. I just have all the sensor data coming from the phone, and the model is all the time saying bored, not bored, bored, not bored. And it's right about 70% of the time. So it's not right all the time, but it's right, you know, a certain amount of time that we found seems to be good enough to, for example, send notifications and have you click on the notification, be more likely to click on the notification and so forth. No, because in experience sampling, in the methodology, um, ideally, it is randomly throughout the day to avoid collection biases, to avoid saying, oh, you introduced a bias because you only popped it up whenever something happens. So it has to be as sort of like neutral as possible. Yes? Well, I mean, that's why we also use the term killing time. Yeah. So, so the. Killing time, I would say, is you start to play a game or stuff. That's what I think you need to remember. Yeah? If you, you see someone is, uh, I don't know, playing a game, then it might be because he's bored. But if I have time, that's a chance. That's just as an example. If I have time, if I'm bored, okay. I use any of my protocols, I do other things. 
so, so, uh, um, so something, one of the triggers for this question was we did a previous study on a Snapchat and we were interested in understanding how teenagers were using a Snapchat. I don't know, you know Snapchat, I imagine all of you. And one of the conclusions of that study was that many people were using a Snapchat when they were bored. So there were a lot of uh, Snapchats that people were sending saying, I'm bored. And it was like sending a bottle into the ocean. They were doing a broadcasting to anyone, I'm bored. And then hoping that someone would like send them something interesting. So that was one of the findings that kind of triggered our interest of saying, wow, it seems that people are reaching to the phone when they are bored and they are looking for the stimuli on the phone. So that was the main reason why we decided to say, okay, could we differentiate when people are using the phone because they think they are bored or whatever, or they are killing time or whatever they want to call it, versus they are using the phone because they are checking their email or they are looking for an important piece of information or they are reading the newspaper or they are doing something intentional, you know, with the phone. Yeah. So maybe, yeah, maybe the younger people uh, think in this way, but I would say, um, yeah. Yeah. No, no yeah. Yeah. Say, people are bored and doing other things or are thinking or whatever, but uh, not necessarily doing something with the phone. Yeah. Okay, I think yeah. there were some other questions. Yeah. Okay. Any other question? Okay, yeah, so, so first of all, you cannot uh, confuse causality with correlation. So second of all, out of 68 features, only six were related to census. And they were not the most important ones when you rank them. So the only reason why I mentioned them is because it was very surprising that the traditional features didn't seem to be so important because the model only picked six out of 68. So for me, the take home message is more human dynamics and what is happening at a daily level, which until now we haven't been able to measure because we haven't had the sensors to measure it, seems very useful to understand different aspects of city life. And in this case was crime, but there could be others. But I wouldn't, I would never, um, uh, first of all, obviously, draw any causality between because this, that. And secondly, as I mentioned, it's only six variables that were picked by the model, but uh, they were not the most important variables. And in fact, the model only using uh, dynamics was doing better than the model using you know, census uh, data. So um, there has been previous literature, as I mentioned at the beginning, that has found correlations between crime and different socioeconomic uh, factors. He mentioned it too, and also uh, uh, unemployment factors and so forth. But the purpose for this, the main purpose for this project was to see the value of human dynamics, to see the value of these uh, dynamics that hadn't been looked uh, so much until now because we hadn't had access you know, to that type of data. As I said, we are working on uh, doing a similar project in a different country and we might find something completely different because also different cultures uh, you know, are totally different in both in terms of how they report the crime in this case but also on what variables you know, might matter. So I think it's important not to make sort of like overstatements <laughs> about any of these. Um, these are research projects and, and I think they are interesting and encouraging but we should also understand you know, the limitations of the research, you know, it's like one particular data set in one particular place, uh, one particular model, which is, you know, we did the best that we could, but uh, there's still a lot of research to be done to be able to sort of like make any claims about any kind of universal, you know, 
or as you say, you know, any kind of causality also, yeah. Yes? So that's a very good question. Um, we, would, we would have loved to do something like this. It's a very interesting question. But we only had two months. And we used one month for training and the other one month for testing. So it was very limited. But that's a very, very interesting question to see how the different hotspots evolve over time and what might make an area become safer or become you know, less safe and how these, these patterns are changing. There, there are also seasonal patterns. You know, the, it's not the same in the summer than in the winter, but we, we, we couldn't because the, the, through the Open Data Institute, there were only these two months of data. But that's a very, very interesting research question. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe the last question. Yeah. How do you think this means or analysis? Anxiety. So we didn't ask, are you anxious? I mean, again, the most important thing is to ask people. Uh, we actually, in addition to asking for boredom, um, we ask, are, are you familiar with sort of like emotional research or affective computing? So the circumflex model has a valence axis and an arousal axis. And usually, all the emotions can be put in this two-dimensional space. For example, if you are very aroused and very positive balance, then you are super excited or super happy. If you are you know, very low in, in very negative balance and very low in arousal, maybe you are depressed. So all the different emotions can be placed. So we also ask people about their arousal level and their positive versus negative balance. But we, uh, we, we haven't, we focused on the boredom because the, the objective of the project was the boredom, but we also collected that. Um, we, we haven't looked into that. And I think anxiety probably falls into, um, I don't know, maybe high arou medium arousal and negative balance or something. I mean, it, this is something that you need to ask people. And then, again, if, you, if the interest is in seeing, which is a very interesting question, does um, using the phone make us more anxious or less anxious? you know, throughout the day, or what is the impact on our anxiety, then you will have to, again, collect ground truth, figure out whether people are anxious before they're using the phone, and then after they're using the phone, and try to understand that. But that's a very interesting question, but we didn't look into that. Thank you. Okay, thank you very okay, much. Thank you. Uh, I must say, I have a complaint. First, first complaint. I learned, I learned that you suppressed our creativity because as the questions showed, there was no boredom in the talk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank wow. you very much. And just this? like a small oh, thank uh, you. gift for uh, thank you so happy much. to have uh, you here you. and thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.